Welcome Age of Vintage Society. Today we will peek in a little bit into Carol Lombard's pocket to find out how did Carol Lombard earn two million dollars. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Carol Lombard was a tomboy who grew up to earn two million dollars. By rights, she would have been World War II's favourite pin-up girl. Tragically, Carol Lombard became Hollywood's first victim of the Second World War. She was desperate to get home to a man she was madly in love with, but it was a love that fueled scandal and gave the gossip columnists more ammunition than they knew how to use. Yet it was a love that, when lost, left one of Hollywood's most solid of leading men a hollow shell. Carol Lombard was the epitome of Hollywood bombshell, but in many ways she was just a girl from Indiana. She began making films as a teenager, overcame a setback when an auto accident scarred her face, survived the transition from silent to talking films, and excelled in the screwball comedies of the 1930s. As a Hoosier schoolgirl, she could run faster and jump farther than any of her classmates. When the neighbourhood kids organised a ball team, Carol was the star first baseman. A tomboy and a good one, she defended her position until her battle-scarred teammates became resigned to it. At Virgil Junior High School, she won trophies and medals for running and broad jumping. As her high school days continued, she became expert in swimming, horseback riding, aquaplaning, tennis and golf. She studied dancing and acquired grace and poise. At a dinner party, a studio executive suggested she take a screen test. The test clicked and Carol was off. She won a role with Edmund Lowe in a melodrama, Married in Haste. Quickly she stepped to three westerns, playing a leading lady to Tom Mix and Buck Jones. Friends told her how Gloria Swanson, Marie Prevost and Harold Lloyd had used the Senate comedies as springboards to stardom. So she obtained a contract from Max Senate and went to work in the comedies for a year and a half. Her first film appearance was at the age of 12, cast as a tomboy when a director spotted her playing baseball in the street. She worked in several films through the 1920s and unlike many starlets made a smooth transition into talkies. Her mother brought her to Los Angeles when Carol was seven. They liked it so well that they stayed. She was just Jane Peters in those days. Her full name was Carol Jane Peters which did not become Carol with an E, Lombard, until she was on the screen. Her studio, to alibi for the mistake, said a numerologist had advised her that a 13-letter name would be better for her than one of 12. Don't let them kid you, honey, Carol told her friends. That's a lot of bunk, but since they're paying me so well, I don't care how they spell my name. Her vocabulary was sprightly. It fitted her for subsequent roles in the screwball comedies she made famous. Her surprise wedding to William Powell took place quietly in her mother's Beverly Hills home. The couple honeymooned in Hawaii after the ceremony on June 26, 1931 but Carol divorced Powell in Reno on August the 18th, 1933, on conventional charges of mental cruelty. Friends worried over the 16-year age difference between Powell and Lombard, but she was sure they could work through it, and they were married in 1931. However, her friends were right, and the couple divorced in 1933. They remained close friends after the divorce, and even continued to work together in films. In 1932, Lombard appeared with Clark Gable in No Man of Her Own. After her divorce, she began sharing a house with Madeline Fields, who became her personal secretary. 
Lombard became known for throwing extravagant, if unconventionally themed, parties. She had relationships with Gary Cooper, George Raft and others. In 1936 she appeared with her ex-husband William Powell in My Man Godfrey, a performance that earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Actress. Also in 36, she became reacquainted with Clark Gable. They fell in love, but Gable was married to oil heiress Rhea Langham. The affair had to be kept quiet, but it proved a stumbling block to his career. Part of the deal to get Gable to come on board as Rhett Butler in Gone with the Wind was a salary increase to cover Gable's divorce. Astute and energetic, she ingratiated herself with gossip writers and studio cheeses, danced her way about town and hosted flamboyant parties. Publicity photos blazoned her sleek figure draped in elegant gowns. You could throw a bolt of fabric at Carol and whichever way it landed, she looked smart, her favourite designer observed. In 1937, she was Hollywood's highest paid actress. The Fox studio grabbed her from Senate for an appearance in Me Gangster. Carol began the sure climb in pay increases, which in 1937 hit a peak of $460,000, highest of any woman in pictures. Since then, her earnings have remained at $400,000 or better every year. Wealth did not impress her. I hope that I never lose the thrill of buying a new dress. Sure, I could buy a dozen dresses at a time, but what fun is that? I like to shop around. I like to buy a suit and wonder if Pappy, her pet name for Gable, will like it. I like to buy one hat and hope it'll look silly, but not too silly. Despite her ambition and success, she was universally liked. She was down-to-earth, good-natured and generous. After filming a movie, she gave gifts to everyone in the crew, even the humblest grip. I live well because I can afford to, she said, but I don't think I'm any happier for the money I have. If I were making $75 a week, I could live on it and be happy. Hell, I did, and I was happy. In January, Gable, unrivalled King of Hollywood, was invited to preside at the country's first war bond rally. Averse to public speaking, he declined. His fearless, uninhibited wife stepped forward. Some reckoned that attractive women could sell more bonds anyway. Travelling by train to Indianapolis, Lombard attracted and stirred large crowds. The goal was to raise $500,000. She sold more than two million dollars. There could have been no better salesman for war bonds than the lovely high-spirited Lombard. Her wise-cracking ribaldry became legend. She was very beautiful and very feminine, Myrna Loy recalled, but she could swear like a stevedore. Alfred Hitchcock reminisced, I liked Lombard very much. She had a bawdy sense of humour and used the language men used with each other. I'd never heard a woman speak that way. She was a forceful personality, stronger I felt than Gable. Looking back, he remarked wistfully, we need ladies on screen, we used to have plenty, and his first example was Lombard. She was a woman to delight men's hearts, another director recalled. She in turn liked men, but with Gable she settled down as a devoted lover and then wife. She abandoned her partying. He disliked Hollywood society. His friends were hunting and fishing pals. The chick, glamorous Lombard, took up skeet shooting and went out duck hunting with the boys. They married while Gable was filming Gone with the Wind and bought a small ranch outside Los Angeles. Renovating the house, she set aside a large room for his gun collection, but omitted a guest room. He relished privacy. Her 
Her marriage to Gable on March 29, 1939 was hailed as an ideal romance. This wedding too was without Hollywood fanfare. Besides the clergyman, the only witnesses present in the Methodist church in Kingman, Arizona, were the pastor's wife and a high school principal who was summoned from his neighbouring home. The Gables moved into an unpretentious ranch house, but never entertained large groups or gave large parties to maintain a front. There was no guest room. Some criticised her once for declaring she wanted to make pictures so she could give her government more income taxes. She was unimpressed at the accusations of egotism. It's the best damned land there is, she answered. After keeping vigil during a friend's difficult labour, I'd go through it, Lombard said. I'd endure all the pain and all the embarrassment of looking like Oliver Hardy. It would be worth it. It was not to be. Impatient to return home from her Midwest war bond mission, she elected to fly. As Flight 3 took off from Las Vegas on the last leg of its cross-country itinerary, its pilots failed to notice that they had plotted a dangerously wrong course. Nor did they notice, looming ahead in the night, Potosi Mountain. Pieces of the wreckage still litter its high rocky slopes. Miss Lombard's secretary, Madeline Fields, whom she called Fieldsy for years, was reported prostrated with shock. The hand of every actor in Hollywood is extended in this moment to Clark Gable, said Edward Arnold, president of the Screen Actors Guild. It is doubly tragic as Miss Lombard was returning from an important patriotic duty in connection with national defence. Arnold referred to the nationwide campaign in which Miss Lombard had sold $2,207,513 worth of defence bonds. Two years later, actress Irene Dunn christened the SS Carol Lombard a Liberty ship. The nautical pack mules of the war, Liberty ships cost $2 million to build, just the sum Lombard had raised selling war bonds. God bless Carol Lombard, Dunn said, swinging the champagne bottle with purpose, and good luck.